antidote to the subsequent canons on residence. I sometimes wonder how it happens that, in such light of the gospel, they are just as absurd as they were wont to be in the thickest darkness. But I immediately turn to reflect on the admirable judgment of God, by which it is certain that they are so blinded and stupefied, that, lost both to sight and feeling, they cast away all shame, and glory unblushingly in their own disgrace. Since the provisions of the church, which were destined for the maintenance of pastors long ago, have begun to be the revenues of idle men, and those who are maintained at the expense of the church think that no obligation lies upon them, they profess to have prepared themselves for the correction of this great iniquity. When they enter upon the subject they seem to say something, where corruption is so rampant, it is, I admit, no small matter that two bishoprics are not to be held by one man. And there are other things of a similar nature, framed to curb the licentiousness which now stalks abroad, although in any reformation which they attempt, they are far, I say not from the primitive and austere discipline which flourished a thousand years ago, but from any tolerable state of pious and well-ordered government. They forbid a bishop to absent himself from his diocese for more than half a year, the leave is liberal enough which gives six months vacation out of twelve to those who ought to watch continually over the flock, both day and night. But even here a reservation is added, unless they have a just excuse for absence. When will they be without such excuse? And yet, supposing they most strictly observe what is here prescribed, what benefit will result, unless, perhaps, that they will not be able to career out of the district all the money which the living yields. If they love the city, they will have their palaces where, away from all noise, they will drink, play, and sleep as usual, if they prefer the country, they will have pleasant retreats in their seats and castles. Thus they will perform their office doing nothing, and yet giving actual residence. As to parishes, they confirm schools in their privileges so that the pretext of studying will excuse absence. Meanwhile, while the young and raw Tyro learns to act the pastor, will he nevertheless draw the milk of the flock which will be left without a pastor? Grant that this may be tolerated, yet who knows not that lazy scullions alone enjoy the privileges of the schools, the consequence will be, that the miserable churches will be forced to rear two wolves one at home and another abroad. The resolution not to give effect in future to dispensations the non promovendo, beyond a year, was, I shrewdly guess, suggested by the granters. For what all addition will be made to their gains, if a new prerogative shall require to be purchased every year. In short, their only care seems to have been to exhibit some show of justice in a state of universal confusion. But even if their regulations had been perfect to a title, good men could not congratulate themselves on the prospect of a better state of matters. For before they enact any law they abrogate all laws together, by one word, or at least point out a method by which they may all be abrogated for they promise that none of the things which they may say are to hinder the apostolic see from maintaining its authority unimpaired. Now, let anyone consider with himself by what limits that authority is bounded, or how far it extends. Does not a preliminary of this kind just mean, that the popes may order anything to be lawful that they please? What remedy, pray? do they bring by so acting. None of the things which they undertake to correct have hitherto been practiced as if permitted by common law, but what the laws prohibited was done with impunity by means of dispensations. Accordingly, those guilty of abuse is never alleged that they observe their strict rule, but having been set free from law, they thought they might do what otherwise in itself was not lawful. The Neptunian fathers now provide that the future shall be no better, by making a special proviso that the power of the Roman court shall suffer no diminution. For though a thousand knots of laws were tied, the sword of Alexander is unsheathed to cut them all at once. Could they more openly mock the Christian world? Why do I say mock? Could they more grossly insult the expectation of the good, 
than when they deliver thus distinctly, and with barbarian haughtiness, that they will set no bounds to the unbridled tyranny of the Pope. Callous as those who live under the papacy have become to all evils, it might be said that on this one matter they had forgotten their bondage, I mean, in not only freely lamenting but crying aloud that the church was ruined by dispensations. All eyes were turned to the venerable fathers, sitting like strict and zealous censors to check the abuse. After pondering for eighteen months they declare their approval of ancient discipline, provided the Roman see retain its right of dispensing as before. In other words, the laws are to be so far enforced that liberty to violate them shall not be gratuitous, but may be purchased, and that the Pope may not be prevented by modesty from boldly exercising the power, they confirm him in the title of universal bishop, which Gregory calls nefarious, blasphemous, abominable, and the forerunner of Antichrist, while they leave nothing more to the bishops than to be his vicars. Where is that equality which Jerome heralds when he compares the bishop of Rome to the bishop of Eugubium, Hiram, Adevag, where is the doctrine of Cyprian that the bishopric of Christ is one, and part of it is held entire, in solidum, by each bishop, Sip, de Simplic, Prelat, Bernard writes that it was a common complaint in his time, that the churches were maimed and mutilated, because the Roman bishop by drawing all power to himself confounded orders, Bernard. To consit. Ad Eng. Lib. 3, to kill this evil the holy council bids bishops be the vicars of the Pope. I will spend no more time in exposing their impudence, but as all see that they are worse than hopeless. Every one who is wise will in future disregard their decrees, and be in no dubiety about them. It were indeed most desirable that the dissensions by which the church is now disturbed should be settled by the authority of a pious council, but as matters are we cannot yet hope for it. Therefore, since churches are scattered in a dreadful manner, and no hope of gathering them together appears from man. Each cannot do better than hasten to rally round the banner which the Son of God holds out to us. This is not a time to keep waiting for one another. As every one sees the light of Scripture beaming forth, let him instantly follow. In regard to the whole body of the Church, we commend it to the care of its Lord. Meanwhile, let us not be either slothful or secure. Let each do his best. Let us contribute whatever in us is of counsel, learning and abilities, to build up the ruins of the church, but, in affairs so desperate, let us be sustained and animated by the promise that, as none appears from among men to undertake the once with manly and heroic mind, the Lord, armed with his own justice and with the weight of his own arm, will himself alone perform all things.